Chapter 10 of Thuvia, Made of Mars, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Chapter 10. Car Comac the Bowman. As Carthoris moved through the forest toward the distant cliffs with Thuvia's hand still tight-pressed in his, he wondered a little at the girl's continued silence, yet the contact of her cool palm against his was so pleasant that he feared to break the spell of her new-found reliance in him by speaking. Onward through the dim wood they passed, until the shadows of the quick-coming Martian night commenced to close down upon them. Then it was that Carthoris turned to speak to the girl at his side. They must plan together for the future. It was his idea to pass through the cliffs at once if they could locate the passage, and he was quite positive that they were now close to it but he wanted her assent to the proposition. As his eyes rested upon her, he was struck by her strangely ethereal appearance. She seemed suddenly to have dissolved into the tenuous substance of a dream, and as he continued to gaze upon her, she faded slowly from his sight. For an instant he was dumbfounded, and then the whole truth flashed suddenly upon him. Jav had caused him to believe that Thuvia was accompanying him through the wood, while, as a matter of fact, he had detained the girl for himself. Carthoris was horrified. He cursed himself for his stupidity, and yet he knew that the fiendish power which the Lotharian had invoked to confuse him might have deceived any. Scarce had he realized the truth than he had started to retrace his steps toward Lothar, but now he moved at a trot, the earthly thews that he had inherited from his father carrying him swiftly over the soft carpet of fallen leaves and rank grass. Thuria's brilliant light flooded the plain before the walled city of Lothar as Carthoris broke from the wood opposite the great gate that had given the fugitives egress from the city earlier in the day. At first he saw no indication that there was another than himself anywhere about. The plain was deserted. No myriad bowmen camped now beneath the overhanging verdure of the giant trees. No gory heaps of tortured dead defaced the beauty of the scarlet sward. All was silence. All was peace. The Heliumite, scarce pausing at the forest's verge, pushed on across the plain toward the city, when presently he descried a huddled form in the grass at his feet. It was the body of a man lying prone. Carthoris turned the figure over upon its back. It was Jav, but torn and mangled almost beyond the recognition. The prince bent low to note if any spark of life remained, and as he did so, the lids raised, and dull, suffering eyes looked up into his. "'The princess of Tarth!' cried Carthoris. "'Where is she? Answer me, man, or I complete the work that another has so well begun.' "'Come all muttered Jav. He sprang upon me, and would have devoured me, but for the girl. Then they went away together into the wood, the girl and the great band, her fingers twined in his tawny mane. Which way went they? asked Carthoris. There, replied Jav faintly, toward the passage through the cliffs. The Prince of Helium waited to hear no more, but springing to his feet, raced back again into the forest. It was dawn when he reached the mouth of the dark tunnel that would lead him to the other world beyond the valley of ghostly memories and strange hypnotic influences and menaces. Within the long dark passages he met with no accident or obstacle, coming at last into the light of day beyond the mountains, and no great distance from the southern verge of the domains of the Turquasians, not more than one hundred and fifty hard at the most. From the boundary of Torquas to the city of Anthor is a distance of some two hundred hods, so that the Heliumite had before him a journey of more than one hundred and fifty earth miles between him and Anthor. He could at best but hazard a chance guess that toward Anthor Thuvia would take her flight. There lay the nearest water, and there might be expected some day a rescuing party from her father's empire for Carthoris knew Thuvan Din well enough to know that he would leave no stone unturned until he had tracked down the truth as to his daughter's abduction, and learned all that there might be to learn 
of her whereabouts. He realized, of course, that the trick which had laid suspicion upon him would greatly delay the discovery of the truth, but little did he guess to what vast proportions had the results of the villainy of Astok of Dusar already grown. Even as he emerged from the mouth of the passage to look across the foothills in the direction of Anthor, a Tarth battle fleet was winging its majestic way slowly toward the twin cities of Helium, while from far distant Kaul raced another mighty armada to join forces with its ally. He did not know that in the face of the circumstantial evidence against him even his own people had commenced to entertain suspicions that he might have stolen the Tarthian princess. He did not know of the lengths to which the Dusarians had gone to disrupt the friendship and alliance which existed between the three great powers of the Eastern Hemisphere, Helium, Tarth, and Kaol. How Dusarian emissaries had found employment in important posts in foreign offices of the three great nations, and how, through these men, messages from one Jeddak to another were altered and garbled, until the patience and pride of the three rulers and former friends could no longer endure the humiliations and insults contained in these falsified papers, not any of this he knew. Nor did he know how, even to the last, John Carter, warlord of Mars, had refused to permit the Jeddak of Helium to declare war against either Tarth or Kaol, because of his implicit belief in his son, and that eventually all would be satisfactorily explained. And now two great fleets were moving upon Helium, while the Dusarian spies at the court of Taurus Moors saw to it that the twin cities remained in ignorance of their danger. War had been declared by Thuvan Din, but the messenger who had been dispatched with a proclamation had been a Dusarian who had seen to it that no word of warning reached the twin cities of the approach of the hostile fleet. For several days diplomatic relations had been severed between Helium and her two most powerful neighbors, and with the departure of the ministers had come a total cessation of wireless communication between the disputants, as is usual upon Barsoom. But of all this Carthoris was ignorant. All that interested him at present was the finding of Thuvia of Tarth. Her trail, beside that of the huge banth, had been well marked to the tunnel, and was once more visible, leading southward into the foothills. As he followed rapidly downward toward the dead sea bottom, where he knew he must lose the spoor in the resilient ochre vegetation, he was suddenly surprised to see a naked man approaching him from the northeast. As the fellow drew closer, Carthoris halted to await his coming. He knew that the man was unarmed, and that he was apparently a Lotharian, for his skin was white and his hair auburn. He approached the Heliumite without sign of fear, and when quite close called out the cheery Barsoomian Kaor of greeting. "'Who are you?' asked Carthoris. "'I am Kar Komat, Odwar of the Bowmen,' replied the other. A strange thing has happened to me. For ages, Tario has been bringing me into existence as he needed the services of the army of his mind. Of all the bowmen, it has been Kar Komak who has been oftenest materialized. For a long time, Tario has been concentrating his mind upon my permanent materialization. It has been an obsession with him that some day this thing could be accomplished and the future of Lothar assured. He asserted that matter was non-existent except in the imagination of man, that all was mental, and so he believed that by persisting in his suggestion he could eventually make of me a permanent suggestion in the minds of all creatures. Yesterday he succeeded, but at such a time. It must have come all unknown to him, as it came to me without my knowledge, as, with my horde of yelling bowmen, I pursued the fleeing Torquasians back to their ochre plains. As darkness settled, and the time came for us to fade once more into thin air, I suddenly found myself alone upon the edge of the great plain which lies yonder at the foot of the low hills. My men were gone back to the nothingness from which they had sprung, but I remained, naked and unarmed. At first I could not understand, but at last came a realization of what had occurred. 
Tario's long suggestions had at last prevailed, and Carcomac had become a reality in the world of men. But my harness and my weapons had faded away with my fellows, leaving me naked and unarmed in a hostile country far from Lothar. "'You wish to return to Lothar?' asked Carthoris. "'No,' replied Carcomac quickly. "'I have no love for Tario. Being a creature of his mind, I know him too well. He is cruel and tyrannical, a master I have no desire to serve. Now that he has succeeded in accomplishing my permanent materialization, he will be unbearable, and he will go on until he has filled Lothar with his creatures. I wonder if he has succeeded as well with the maid of Lothar. I thought there were no women there, said Carthoris. In a hidden apartment in the palace of Tario, replied Carcomat, the Jeddak has maintained the suggestion of a beautiful girl, hoping that some day she would become permanent. I have seen her there. She is wonderful. But for her sake I hope that Tario succeeds not so well with her as he has with me. Now, Redman, I have told you of myself. What of you? Carthoris liked the face and manner of the bowman. There had been no sign of doubt or fear in his expression as he had approached the heavily armed Heliumite, and he had spoken directly and to the point. So the Prince of Helium told the bowman of Lothar who he was and what adventure had brought him to this far country. Good, exclaimed the other, when he had done. Carcomac will accompany you. Together we shall find the Princess of Tarth, and with you Carcomac will return to the world of men, such a world as he knew in the long-gone past, when the ships of mighty Lothar ploughed angry Throxus, and the roaring surf beat against the barrier of these parched and dreary hills. What mean you? asked Carthoris. Had you really a former actual existence? Most assuredly, replied Carcomac. In my day, I commanded the fleets of Lothar, mightiest of all the fleets that sailed the five salt seas. Wherever men lived upon Barsoom, there was the name of Carcomac known and respected. Peaceful were the land races in those distant days. Only the seafarers were warriors. But now has the glory of the past faded. Nor did I think until I met you that there remained upon Barsoom a single person of our own mould who lived and loved and fought as did the ancient seafarers of my time. Ah, but it will seem good to see men once again, real men. Never had I much respect for the landsmen of my day. They remained in their walled cities, wasting their time in play, depending for their protection entirely upon the sea race, and the poor creatures who remain, the Tarios and Jobs of Lothar, are even worse than their ancient forebears. Carthoris was a trifle sceptical as to the wisdom of permitting the stranger to attach himself to him. There was always the chance that he was but the essence of some hypnotic treachery which Tario, or Jav, was attempting to exert upon the Heliumite. And yet, so sincere had been the manner and the words of the bowman, so much the fighting man did he seem, but Carthoris could not find it in his heart to doubt him. The outcome of the matter was that he gave the naked Odwar leave to accompany him, and together they set out upon the spoor of Thuvia and Komal. Down to the ochre sea-bottom the trail led. There it disappeared, as Carthoris had known that it would. But where it entered the plain its direction had been toward Anthor, and so toward Anthor the two turned their faces. It was a long and tedious journey, fraught with many dangers. The bowman could not travel at the pace set by Carthoris, whose muscles carried him with great rapidity over the face of the small planet, the force of gravity of which exerts so much less retarding power than that of the earth. Fifty miles a day is a fair average for a Barsoomian, but the son of John Carter might easily have covered a hundred or more miles had he cared to desert his newfound comrade. All the way they were in constant danger of discovery by roving bands of Torquasians, and especially was this true before they reached the boundary of Torquas. Good fortune was with them, however, and although they sighted two detachments of the savage green men, they were not themselves seen. And so they came, upon the morning of the third day, within sight of the glistening domes of distant Anthor. 
Throughout the journey Cartharis had ever strained his eyes ahead in search of Fulvia and the great band. But not till now had he seen aught to give him hope. This morning, far ahead, halfway between themselves and Anthor, the men saw two tiny figures moving toward the city. For a moment they watched them intently. Then Cartharis, convinced, leaped forward at a rapid run, Carcomac following as swiftly as he could. The Heliumite shouted to attract the girl's attention and presently he was rewarded by seeing her turn and stand looking toward him. At her side the great banth stood with up-pricked ears, watching the approaching man. Not yet could Puvia of Tarth have recognized Carthoris, though that it was he she must have been convinced, for she waited there for him without sign of fear. Presently he saw her point toward the northwest, beyond him. Without slackening his pace, he turned his eyes in the direction she indicated. Racing silently over the thick vegetation, not half a mile behind, came a score of fierce green warriors, charging him upon their mighty thoats. To their right was Carcomac, naked and unarmed, yet running valiantly toward Carthoris, and shouting warning, as though he too had but just discovered the silent, menacing company that moved so swiftly forward with couched spears and ready longswords. Carthoris shouted to the Lotharian, warning him back, for he knew that he could but uselessly sacrifice his life by placing himself all unarmed in the path of the cruel and relentless savages. But Carcomac never hesitated. With shouts of encouragement to his new friend, he hurried onward toward the Prince of Helium. The red man's heart leaped in response to this exhibition of courage and self-sacrifice. He regretted now that he had not thought to give Carcomac one of his swords, but it was too late to attempt it, for should he wait for the Lotharian to overtake him, or return to meet him, the Torquasians would reach the Uvia of Tarth before he could do so. Even as it was, it would be nip and tuck as to who came first to her side. Again he turned his face in her direction, and now, from Anthor way, he saw a new force hastening toward them two medium-sized warcraft, and even at the distance they still were from him, he discerned the device of Dusar upon their bows. Now, indeed, seemed little hope for Thuvia of Tarth. With savage warriors of the hordes of Torquas charging toward her from one direction, and no less implacable enemies in the form of the creatures of Astok, prince of Dusar, bearing down upon her from another, while only a banth, a red warrior, and an unarmed bowman were near to defend her, her plight was quite hopeless, and her cause already lost ere ever it was contested. As Thuvia saw Carthoris approaching, she felt again that unaccountable sensation of entire relief from responsibility and fear that she had experienced upon a former occasion. Nor could she account for it, while her mind still tried to convince her heart, that the Prince of Helium had been instrumental in her abduction from her father's court. She only knew that she was glad when he was by her side, and that with him there all things seemed possible, even such impossible things as escape from her present predicament. Now had he stopped, panting before her. A brave smile of encouragement lit his face. "'Courage, my princess,' he whispered. To the girl's memory flashed the occasion upon which he had used those same words, in the throne-room of Tario of Lothar, as they had commenced to slip down the sinking marble floor toward an unknown fate. Then she had not chidden him for the use of that familiar salutation, nor did she chide him now, though she was promised to another. She wondered at herself, flushing at her own turpitude, for upon Barsoom it is a shameful thing for a woman to listen to those two words from another than her husband or her betrothed. Carthoris saw her flush of mortification, and in an instant regretted his words. There was but a moment before the green warriors would be upon them. Forgive me, said the man in a low voice. Let my great love be my excuse. That, and the belief that I have but a moment more of life and with the words he turned to meet the foremost of the green warriors. The fellow was charging with couched spear, but Cartharis leaped to one side, 
and as the great foat and its rider hurtled harmlessly past him, he swung his long sword in a mighty cut that clove the green carcass in twain. At the same moment Carcomac leaped with bare hands, clawing at the leg of another of the huge riders. The balance of the horde raced in to close quarters, dismounting the better to wield their favorite long swords. The Dusarian flyers touched the soft carpet of the ochre-clad sea bottom, disgorging fifty fighting men from their bowels, and into the swirling sea of cutting, slashing swords sprang Komal, the great banth. End of chapter ten. Recording by Thomas Copeland.